Hello everyone, my name is Srivat Supadhyay and today I'll be talking to you about JWT and HashiVault in modern apps and infrastructure. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm a cloud developer advocate at VMware. Uh, I focus on deploying applications on public cloud as well as uh, how to manage application security. I'm part of the Cloud Journey IO team. Uh, you can visit our website at cloudjourney.io and you can follow me on Twitter, Medium or GitHub at iShrivats. Let's take a quick look at the agenda. Uh, I'll be talking about the problem statement. So basically, what are we going to discuss in today's talk? I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between OAuth, OIDC, and JWT, a little bit more details on those, uh, why I chose HashiCorp Vault, and how Vault works with OIDC, and then I'll try to do a live demo. Let's get started. So most of us are probably using one or more cloud providers today, whether it's AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or your on-premises environment. And in either scenario, uh, you would need uh, some keys so that you can go and put them into your Terraform template, and Terraform can go and deploy the application for you. Uh, usually we see developers doing this as part of CI/CD pipelines by using uh, tools like Jenkins. But what we, what we are trying to solve here is we want to provide a consistent user experience when it comes to getting these keys, right? We don't want the user to use 10 different logins to go to AWS, Azure, or a separate login to go grab uh, other credentials. So to make it easier, uh, we also need the ability to store these uh, secrets uh, in a secure location. Because that can get uh, give others like uh, unwanted people access to your environment, right? And also in scenarios where let's say accidentally your developer pushes the keys uh, to GitHub repository or the keys haven't been used in a long time, you would want the ability to revoke them. And today, if you have to do that, you might have to go to your AWS console or Azure console and delete those keys. Or maybe you have written a script to delete them. But again, it's not scalable uh, when your teams are expanding. And another important thing is the ability to audit. When your organization starts growing, you want to find out which particular user is trying to create keys for a particular role or for a particular service. Yes, uh, can you use CloudTrail in Amazon to do that and other logging systems? You can, but now you have to correlate across different systems. So this problem has kind of been solved uh, in the enterprises already. So most of us uh, use Okta, or some kind of Active Directory service where uh, we tell the authorization server, hey, you know, this is my user profile. You know, Shri is basically a developer and he needs these permissions. And whenever I try to access any other application, the information about me is sent to that app. And based on the role-based access that is set up in the system, I get access to a particular uh, service within that system. So we will try to see how we can extend that ability even to our uh, you know, modern apps and modern infrastructure. And finally, we want to control all of this using a policy, right? Uh, doing it user by user or group by group is not scalable, but doing it by a policy, you can restrict which users have access to what kind of credentials within your environment. Not all the developers, maybe not all the developers within your environment need access to AWS, right? Uh, they might need access to Azure. And some might be just working within the instances themselves. So they might need credentials like SSH keys and others might need database credentials. So we want to craft policies so that it adheres and it also helps our developers to do what uh, they would like to. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, like within enterprises, we are already used uh, to using AD and other authorization systems. When we talk about authorization systems, uh, we often hear about OAuth, OIDC, and JWT. And there often seems to be some uh, confusion uh, and people try to use the words interchangeably uh, when it comes to these technologies. So let me just set the stage uh, first before we dive deep into this. First of all, OAuth 2.0 is an industry standard protocol, right? It provides specific authorization flows. Basically it tells, okay, what should happen when a user is trying to log in from a web, mobile, IoT device, or a desktop application. 
and it clearly defines the flows for that. OAuth 2.0 is a successor of SAML. Uh, most of you might have probably heard of this. Uh, it is security assertion markup language. It's basically, uh, it uses XML as an exchange format for transferring data from one application to another application about the user. OAuth 2.0 is very convenient in the aspect that it is very open-ended. Uh, it does not put, you, put hard restrictions on you as to how to do things. So you can configure and adapt to how your application is. And then we have OIDC, uh, which is Open ID Connect, which is written on top of OAuth 2.0. This uh, is a framework which narrows down the scopes of OAuth 2.0, right? Like I mentioned earlier, OAuth uh, has a very broad scope. Uh, it allows the user to do whatever they want. And in such scenarios, if every application is building their own uh, version of OAuth by using their own custom parameters, it will be very difficult for two applications to integrate together. So that's where OIDC comes in and says, hey, you know what? I'm going to define, clearly define some of the scopes. Uh, like I'm going to say, whenever you want the information about user, I'm going to give you the profile, email, address, and so on and so forth, along with access tokens and ID tokens. So it restricts the scope uh, pretty much, but it makes it very easier for applications to integrate. So if you're building a new app today and you use OIDC, and if you're working with any other big organization for integration, you know that they are, uh, you know what data to expect when the information is sent over to you. So in OIDC, we have something called as access tokens, which are used to access the information from a system. Uh, and then we have ID token, which contains the information about the user themselves. And I'll show in a bit uh, how this thing works. And then we have JWT, which is JSON Web Tokens. They're basically self-contained and compact information exchange standards. Right? Uh, it defines a basic structure for organizing the data. And it, is, it can be digitally signed using HMAC or public-private key. And this is where uh, OIDC comes into the picture and it leverages JWT for its access tokens. So it says, hey, you know what? Most of the applications nowadays are using JSON and JWT fits right there. And it has a uh, very nice structure of organizing data, which fits well with OAuth 2.0 and OIDC. So that's how these are structured, right? OAuth 2.0 is the standard on which OIDC is written is the framework and OIDC leverages JWT to perform information exchange. Let's look at a little bit more details on OIDC and JWT. So you might hear these terms often uh, when pertaining to OIDC or JWT. So that's why I want to get this uh, concepts here. Uh, J First of all, let's uh, talk about JWT structure. Right? It contains three parts. Uh, that is the header, payload, and the signature. The header defines uh, the algorithm which we are going to use for encryption. It tells the type of token. In our case for OIDC, it would be JWT. And then the key ID, which is basically the ID that points to a secret that is used for encryption. It's not the secret itself. It's just the ID for the secret. And then we have the payload, uh, which contains claims. Claims are basically key value pairs, uh, and you can put information in that. So I can put user ID uh, within the claim but please do not put any uh, sensitive information within the payload. Both header and payload are base64 encoded. Base64 encoding is not encryption. Uh, and then we have signatures, which are basically a combination of your headers, the payload, and the secret, right, which we use for encryption along with the algorithm that was specified. So this assures that this particular JSON token was issued by a source which you trust. And then we have access tokens, which are used to request uh, information from the resources, like I mentioned earlier. So in your API call, when you're making a get or a post request, you can put the token within the header, like authorization, bearer, and then your token. So for OIDC, access token must be in JWT format, right? And then we have refresh tokens, which are used to renew access tokens. So the thing with access and refresh token is that every token comes with an expiry time, time to live. After that, the token is no longer valid. 
So if your access token expires, you can use the refresh token to request a new access token or renew the time on the access token. Refresh token itself does not grant you any permission to resource. So if you make an API call with refresh token, you will get probably permission denied. The refresh token may or may not be in JWT format, so it's uh, pretty flexible. So if you ha have, have ever used banking applications, you'll see, hey, you have only 30 seconds left. Do you want to continue? That's basically indicating that your access token is expiring. And if you hit continue, it will use the refresh token to get a new access token and keep you logged in. And then you'll hear about scopes. Uh, scopes are used to apply fine-grained control uh, to actions or resources within the system. So I can say, hey, you know, if I see the user's location or address is from US, I'm going to do these five actions or I'm going to allow access to these resources. But if they are from Europe, I'm going to allow them some different access to some different systems. And you can customize them, right? And OIDC defines some of these scopes for you. Uh, it's profile, email, phone, address, and open ID itself is a scope. Uh, if you if you want to add your own scopes, you would be going into OAuth 2.0 domain because OIDC, like I mentioned earlier, restricts everything. And then we have claims. Uh, we saw in the JWT structure, claims were added to payload. They are key value pairs. Claims are always three characters long. And then there are three types of claims. One is registered claim, uh, there is public claim and private claim. Registered claims are standard claims, which are like uh, issuer who, is, who has issued the token, the expiry time, the subject, the audience, and also the, issue, the issued at time, at what time was this issued. Public claims are other claims which are not part of registered, but they are defined as standards and you can go to IANA website and you can find more public claims over there. And private claims, again, you know, they're key value pairs, but you might use them if you have to define something very specific to your application. So if you make some decisions based on those values, that's what would go in private claims. So how does uh, Hashi Vault fit into all this picture? So if you remember from earlier uh, problem statement, we wanted the ability uh, to manage all the secrets for across all the different cloud providers, my databases, my SSH keys. And we wanted the ability to audit and log and make the user experience better. With HashiVault, it's a self-operated and self-hosted uh, tool. It has a freemium model. And in today's demo, I'll be using the open source version. Uh, it keeps the keys encrypted. That's fantastic. We have lifecycle management uh, of secrets. So it can store, rotate, revoke, and expire the keys, which was again one of our requirements. It has, it supports identity-based access to secrets. So I can say, uh, Shri can access these four secrets, uh, whereas a colleague can access only two of the secrets, right? And this identity-based access can be just simple username, password, or you can integrate with external identity providers. And in today's demo, I'll be integrating with GitHub and I'll show you how the flow works. And then uh, it also supports policies. So you can construct very granular policies and restrict uh, unauthorized access. And obviously it's cloud agnostic, so that's fantastic. It works across AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, VMware, and any other infrastructure you may think of. And seamlessly integrates with Terraform uh, to pass your credentials uh, without even setting environment variables. So let's look at the architecture, right? Uh, this is what I'm going to show you in today's demo. First, the user logs into the vault uh, and then vault will redirect me to my authorization server. In my case, the authorization server is Auth0. Uh, you may have Okta or any other AD provider. And then the credential I enter is validated with the external ID provider. So here I'm using the integration with GitHub. Uh, so the information goes to GitHub, uh, GitHub validates uh, my data and then returns the user information based on the defined scope. So you remember the scopes which we were talking earlier, like profile information, email, uh, phone number, address, or other data. data. And the OGZ server gets this data, constructs a JWT out of it, and then sends the information to Vault. Vault, once it validates, you'll see that during Vault setup, 
we let it know what the Authy server is, the client ID, and the client secret. So it can actually verify if this JWT was issued by the Authy server uh, of, uh, of a trusted Authy server. Once this is done, Vault then issues a token to the user. This token can be used by user to access the secrets within the system based on the policies defined. So now I can, uh, the user can say, hey, you know what, I want AWS credential. Uh, Vault will go to AWS, create a dynamic secret, uh, which is generated just in time, and then return it to the user. And the user can then use the keys and probably revoke it later when they need to. Uh, I've also spoken about earlier about how to use Vault with Terraform and Jenkins and how that entire integration works. If you would like to read more about that, you can go to my GitHub repository and look for all the scripts and files over there. So now let's uh, switch to the demo and let's look at how this works. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start my Vault server. Uh, I'm starting the Vault server in dev mode. Uh, please do not do this in your production environments. And then uh, I have the log level set to debug just to show you guys uh, all the data that is being sent, right? And over here on the right side, you can see I have a few scripts. I've created AWS Vault setup, and then there is demo OIDC and some policy and config files. Let's look at what these files contain. Uh, first of all, uh, I have an AWS Vault setup file, uh, which basically sets up uh, Vault with AWS integration. I'm not going to cover that in today's talk. Uh, I have another talk uh, with, at Hashi Talks 2020 about securing AWS accounts with Vault. You can watch that for more info. And then I'm setting up uh, the OIDC. So in that, if you see on line one, I'm uploading the policy, right? Uh, I'm uploading a policy called as Hashi policy. And on the right side, I have the policy open. Here you can see I'm saying, you know, the user will have access to all the secrets, but they will have these capabilities, meaning they can create, read, update, and list, but they cannot delete the secret. And similarly for the identity, and then I'm also giving them permission to list the policies, but they can't read the policy. I don't want them to look inside the policy. Now, obviously I have the AWS setup so they can go uh, create and update or list their AWS keys. Remember, this will not list all the keys within your AWS account. That is covered uh, in the part of AWS setup. I have set up another policy in which this gives just access to the S3 service within this environment. So during this demo. And then I have enabled OIDC over here on the left side. I have a uh, the config that needs to go. I'm creating a default role called as HashiTalks. And over here, you can see the configuration at the bottom for HashiTalks. I'll come to that in a bit. And we have a few fields. Basically, the OIDC discovery URL, which is the point where your Authy server lives. So I'm using Auth0, like I mentioned earlier. I have a client ID, and then I have a client secret. And who's the issuer? The issuer in this case is localhost because I'm running Vault from here. And then in my role itself for HashiTalks, I have a user claim basically saying, hey, you know, where can I find the user info? And the claim would be sub, the subject. In that, I'm going to store the user related ID. And then I have a redirect, which is set up to localhost because my vault runs here. So whether you're using a UI base or you're running from CLI, uh, you need to provide different URIs. And then I have bond audience, who is the audience? In my case, it would be the client ID. The scope is open ID, time to live is one hour. And I'm, up, I'm saying attach this policy whenever the user satisfies all the requirements, right? Right side, hash your policy. So now let's go and set it up, right? So I'm going to run AWS Vault setup. I have the Vault setup over here. Then let's set up uh, OIDC. So it's logged in and I'm going to see if what is running. You can see on the left side, there are logs. So Walt is running here and I'm going to log in as root just to show you how permissions work. So with root, I can do whatever I want. So I'm going to say Walt policy list, lists a policy. And let's see if I can read the policy. And I can say hashy policy. Yes, I can read the policy. That's great. 
So now, uh, let me show you what is happening on the odd zero side. This is my odd zero server. Let me just refresh the dashboard. So right now I don't have any users uh, authorized to my system, right? So I'm gonna come in here. I'm going to say vault login method equals OIDC. And you'll see that it automatically redirected me to a web browser. So if you see here on my CLI, it's still waiting for the response. And it says, wants access to HashiTalks 2020, which I have set up in my Auth0 server. So I can either log in using username password, or I can continue with GitHub. Let me log in with my GitHub account. And I'm going to put my username password. And then it asks me for MFA. Uh, okay, let me grab my MFA from my phone. And now it's saying you are being redirected. And it says, Srivats Hashi Talks 2020 app wants to accept uh, and wants to authorize you. So I'm going to say accept. And it says signed in successfully via your OIDC provider. If I go back to my CLI, you'll see that it has authenticated. It has set the token on my uh, environment as my environment variable and just to show you this is not a fake account this is my actual account right i have the information over here you can see cloud developer advocate and if i go to my users page now you will see information over here this is the real profile it says uh now i can look at the information right cloud developer advocate and this was the information which was from my uh, from GitHub account and has also pulled the image because that's a part of the scope, right? But within my logs, you can see here, there's a JWT token, which is passed, right? So this is the token, which I was talking about earlier in the workflow. And let's see what data it contains, right? So I can come to JWT IO and I paste here, and there you go. You can see here, the header contains the algorithm, the key type, and the key ID, the ID, this is not the secret itself, but it's just the ID. And then the payload contains all the claims. The issuer was my Auth0 server. Uh, subject is my GitHub, is my user ID. That is from the GitHub. My audience is my Auth0 server, the client ID. It was issued at this time, and this is the expiry date. Like I said earlier, please do not store any information on the header or on the payload, which is sensitive because you don't need encryption for that. Yeah, I cannot verify the signature right now over here uh, completely because I don't have the private key, right? If I would had, then I can do that verification as well. But since I'm logged in here, you remember, I had the policy set so that the user can list the policies. I'm sorry, it's the vault policy list, but the user couldn't do read on the policy. Remember you, the uh, root user was able to do read, but I cannot do it. This is permission denied. But I did have permission to go and create credentials for AWS. So I can come in here, I can say, hey, you know what, give me credentials for AWS. And there you go. It has, it is now showing access key and secret key that I can use for my account. And if I come to my AWS console and refresh it, there you go. It has created wall using OIDC on GitHub for this particular user ID and the S3 role. So you can see how seamless uh, this experience is, right? Uh, we were able to integrate with GitHub. Uh, Walt was able to identify uh, what role I hold. And then it was able to provide me the appropriate credentials for my environment. And I can do this across different cloud providers. And in summary, uh, first of all, do not store sensitive information in claims within JWT. It's just base64 encoded. Uh, scopes should not be too broad because scopes will tell what kind of information I can get from that app. If it is too broad, then your customer data might be leaked. Uh, rotate the keys often. Uh, this is always the best practice uh, to avoid any kind of scenario where the keys or secrets might have been compromised. And design granular policies for your secrets access. Uh, do not give unnecessary access to all the secrets uh, where it is not necessary. 
right? Some people don't need database credentials while others might need, uh, you know, SSH keys. So think through that and uh, combine them into groups and design your policies. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn, GitHub, or Twitter at iStreavers. You can scan this QR code to visit our website, Cloud Journey IO. Thanks.